talking a little bit before uh, this discussion, and if you don't mind, since you're to my immediate left, I'd love to start with Nancy. So many of us are charged up about the political race, of course, and every week everybody's sort of talking about who's up, who's down, what, the, what all the policies are all about. And I was curious, Nancy, what you think about the two candidates in terms of their health care programs, because so many people seem to be a little confused about what the candidates are really offering. Which one seems to have what seems to be more of a realistic plan, if at all? Neither. Um, you know, but I, I, I preface this by telling you I have a phenomenal bias as a physician and as a patient, as a mother, and as you know, a healthcare advocate. Um, and I think the problem is for both is that um, neither has the courage yet to really speak the truth. Are you saying because they can't be paid for, or why? No, no, because I think that on the campaign trail, especially right now, everybody's playing it safe. So there are a couple of issues. When Gwen Eiffel asked both of them during the debate, is health care a right or a privilege, um, they both blew it, because they assumed it was an either or. I think it's an and and. I think you have the right to assume that you can send your child to school with food in his or her tummy, and afford immunizations and access to quality health care. I also think it's a responsibility of each of us to take as good a care of ourselves as we can so that we don't drain the health care dollars. You know, 90% of health care dollars are spent in the last year of life. And what Americans are yet unwilling to talk about is that R word, that ration word. Are we going to pay for everything? We can't. Who's going to get what? Those are tough decisions. And on a presidential campaign, you can't have that. And well, I applaud Hillary for trying. There is a little bit of, oh God, not me. Um, nobody really wants to step into that arena yet. So I don't think you've seen anything courageous from either man yet. Wow. Well, a little departure, if we could, from politics, Pat. Why don't we talk a little bit about, because as we looked at all those photos of your career there, I mean, it's amazing, and I talked to Barbara Walters. Didn't you Walters. love all those hairstyles? <laughs> all those hot hairstyles so and all the So embarrassing when you have to sit and look through them. But when you look back to those days, and it's always interesting to hear Barbara Walters talk about what it was like being such a trailblazer as a woman. What was one of the most enduring lessons for you as a woman who broke down such barriers? Well, it's a lesson I take with me today. Ironically, the title of this luncheon is Changing the Landscape for Women. And that's why women were originally recruited into media companies in the early 70s, as Barbara and I were, is that we were supposed to change the landscape. Only problem was they didn't want us to change anything. Uh, they wanted us to fit in as much as possible, wear ugly suits, lower our voices, and never, ever, ever cover a women or a children's story. Uh, and when that began to change was when women who were inside these media companies, and this was happening across America, but in particular media, Deborah, because what we do and what we say and what we focus on has such impact way beyond the one or two numbers. So when the numbers got better, when you could find allies as well as mentors, because you were no longer protecting the one little place allotted for a woman or a minority, we began to talk to each other and say, wait a minute, we were brought in here to change, we were brought in here to bring a different perspective, our full set of experiences as wives, mothers, daughters, all of the things that we are, and here we are, not speaking up. In the 70s, there were no stories on domestic violence. There were no stories on child abuse. You couldn't say the word breast. You couldn't say the word breast. The, all of the stories that now we take for granted happen because women inside media companies finally found their own voice. And for me, that was the lesson. If you're not speaking in your own voice, if you're not bringing to every table in every room where you are privileged to be invited in and given a seat, then you change nothing. And that is the most significant lesson that I take into every aspect of my life. Sweet honey, and, and, you know, here they were, they could just sing beautiful songs, which you do. But you sang a song about domestic violence. I mean, I thought you're using your voices every time you take the stand for something that matters to all women. And for me, that's the lesson. And we thank you, too, Pat. We thank you for all you've given to us. Uh, so Abby, in this age of new media, is it easier for young women who are coming up to be able to have their voices heard, do you think? No, no, uh, sadly, I don't think so. Um, there's... <coughs> More dialogue, I think, 
um, at the abstract level about the position of women and so forth, but we are so saturated with um, popular media that's so highly sexualized um, and regressive uh, in terms of women's roles. Um, so that I think that it has the effect of taking adolescent girls, I'm the mother of two adolescent daughters, and beating them down a bit. And, uh, and confusing the boys we're trying to raise to be feminist men. Um, so I think that we're actually at a very awful moment. The way I think of it is, it's like when you go in the, to the beach and you go out and you get to that point where the waves are just breaking on you and it'd be easier to go back or forward, but where you're standing is really bad. I think we're kind of right there. Um, because we're, we're at maximum confusion. And it's creating, I think, um, an incredibly difficult dynamic for the younger people coming up. Um, the, the film that we made, um, and my director, Ginny Redeker, is here. And I, I, I always feel like Eve if I don't give Ginny credit because she made such a beautiful film. Um, it, was, it was a decision that we made very early on to only use um, the women's voices to not bring a narrator in. Um, because especially in a documentary, a narrator has this effect of you know, being the voice of authority, and, and so often in documentaries, particularly about women, particularly about women in Africa, um, the impulse is to pull a narrator in and, and, and therefore make a sort of sub subconscious announcement that these women aren't really speaking from authority already. Um, and it was a difficult decision to make, and um, there were, you know, filmic consequences in the editing room. It was quite a difficult feat to edit a film that was coherent without a narrator. Um, and along the way, we had people say to us over and over and over again, you know, oh, just bring in a narrator, it'll be so much easier. Bring in a narrator, it'll be so much easier. And, um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be in a position not to be beholden to somebody else. Were we working for a larger media company? Were we subject to the whims of a producer who um, had the purse strings? We would have a film with a narrator, and we'd have a very different film. Um, and now, when we take this film to Africa, we take it anywhere, um, it's one of the first things African women comment on. Um, they say to me almost immediately, oh my God, thank you for just letting these women speak for themselves. So these are seem like small and consequential decisions, but unless you have women, you know, with the resources and capacity and capital um, and position to make these kinds of calls with an understanding about you know the enormous consequences of those tiny little decisions, um, we won't move this forward at all. 